overwhelmed. This is so beautiful. When, when I won the honor award, I was given a clock, and the, the clock has a little battery in it, and it's, it's similar to the, the plaque. I, I'm kind of picturing them in my studies, sitting next to each other. <laughs> it's very, very sweet and moving. I think I'll begin with a few thanks and then read a, a couple of the poems from the book. So, let's, okay, I <laughs> wanted to see what was behind me now. Yeah. First, thank you, Pennsylvania, for your warm welcome. As I flew in, I was really intrigued by the landscape. And then my friend Gretchen Liuzzi, we're old friends from college days, um, drove me from Philadelphia up to, to receive the award. And I was, again, struck by the beauty of the landscape. Then when I came in, I was looking. I've wanted, I always like to find my way around someplace when I first get here. So I was looking around with that look like, OK, where does that hallway go? And where do these steps go? And I met um, Dot. I'm not sure where, where Dot is, if she's here today. But she's the treasurer. And she was sitting on a corner. Dot, yeah, wave your hand or something. There's Dot, way back in the corner. But she was sitting there, and she said, you look like you're reconnoitering. Well, that was a word that my father always used when we were kids. I'm one of 10 children. We'd be out camping or something, and he'd say, oh, let's just get out and reconnoiter a little bit. So just the, the word reconnoiter made me feel right at home and, and welcome somehow. So it's been a very welcoming couple of days while I've been here. So thank you for that. Um, thank you just for the deep honor of this award um, on two counts. One, just. I, I really appreciate the recognition of the importance of poetry for children. That's one thing that Lee is doing. And then the, the second thing is to honor an individual poet. And to be that poet is, as I think it was Patricia said, humbling. And it's amazing to me that I was selected both in, you know, for the braid as an honor and this year to actually win the award. Um, so I thank B Lee Bennett Hopkins for endowing the award, Stephen Herb and Carolyn Wormuth for administering it. It's, I, from being a judge last year, I know how much work they do. Um, the judges have already been named, but I, I want to thank Carla Schmidt, Jamie Adolph, Cheryl Friedenberg, Eileen Kern, and Michael Leonard for lots of careful reading and what must have been incredibly difficult judging. I read enough children's poetry that I knew my chances of, of winning this were slim because there were so many good books last year. I congratulate Patricia McKissick and Margarita Engel for sharing this year's honor. And I want to say that my, the honor that I feel is magnified by the list of the people who have won both this year in the, the other honor books and in previous years. Um, I think I'll pause here and read th um, three of the poems, and I believe that those are in the slideshow. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about the, the form. The, the title, Diamond Willow, is taken from these willow sticks that you see behind here. It's a, a kind of tree. It's not a species of willow. It's, a, it's like a, a type, something that happens to a particular shrub willow where a branch is injured or there's a fungus or something, and a branch falls away. And then where the branch was, this diamond shape forms around it. So when you see the, the one on the, um, the left shows what it looks like when you see it out in the wild. With the, it's co you know, covered with lichen and bark. And it takes a discerning eye to see that it will be beautiful. Um, and then as you see on the other sticks, these, these diamond shapes have the, a sort of a dark center where that branch fell away. That became a, a central metaphor of my book, that I think all of us are shaped, our strength and our beauty, everything that, that people recognize about us. We're, we're shaped as much by our suffering and our losses as by our achievements and successes. So I think the way that those things work together in, even in children's lives is important for, for me to recognize in them. Um, so go ahead and put the first poem up. I'll read the first three poems. I'm, I, you know, it's hard, I know most of you haven't read the book, so I don't want to do too many spoilers. But I thought if I begin by reading three of the poems, you'll see how I structured these um, diamond-shaped poems with the, the dark place in the middle, where that, that's kind of a little hidden message that pops out of each one. 7 AM, 
20 below zero, ribbons of white and green and purple dancing in the blue-black sky. I'm up with Dad as usual, feeding our six dogs. I climb the ladder to the cache, toss four dried salmon out to Dad. He watches me as I back down. Be careful on that broken rung. I pack snow into the dog pot. Dad gets a good fire going in the oil drum stove. He loves these dogs like I do. We're both out here on weekends as much as we can be, and every day before and after school. He loves Roxy most. Willow, go get the pliers, he says, showing me a quill in Roxy's foot. It's surprising that a porcupine is out this time of year. I bring the pliers, Dad pulls out the quill, rubs in salve. Then we go from dog to dog, spreading fresh straw. Hey, Magoo, hey, Samson. Roxy, you stay off that foot today. Dad pats Prince on the head. Lucky sniffs my hand. She smells salmon. I find a burr in Cora's ear and get it out. The snow melts into water, simmers in the cooking pot. I drop in the salmon, add some cornmeal. The dogs love that smell. They start to howl, and I howl back. And did I miss the slide of the um, cash? Was that before that poem? Let's go back to that, because this is um, actually a, p a photograph taken by my friend Gretchen, who drove me up today. Um, this was, I lived in, in Alaska for, uh, in the, the interior of Alaska, where I'm, that's where the landscape of this book comes from. I lived there for three years in a small village, and this picture was taken 17 miles upriver. I cross-country skied up to, up to this place at, at one point. Um, the, the family lived there by themselves, and this is looking out the window of their log house out to the cache, which was a, you know up on stilts. You can see the ladder off to the side. That's what, what her father is saying, be careful on that broken rung. You'd push the ladder away when you weren't using it so that the animals couldn't climb up in, and then you'd put it back over, you know, it would lean back so that the, um, you could climb up and get whatever you had in there. People would keep any food that they got in the fall time, the moose or the salmon or anything, they'd keep that in the cache and put the ladder away so that they, um, the animals couldn't get into it.